Does anyone find the first greeting a little bit scary? It seems very gentle. The tone is very gentle, but the statements that it makes are very scary because what it does is it puts freedom on us. It gives us a series of choices that have severe and important consequences that we are called to make. It says, simple enough, if you choose, you can keep the commandments. They will save you. Do we? Is it simple? Then we set forth a series of choices, fire and water, life and death, good and evil. Whatever you choose will be given to you. What do we choose? In this very difficult and complicated historical moment, what do we choose? What brings life? What is good? Travel bans, walls, migrants, refugees, immigrants, health care, care for the poor. How do we choose? What do we choose? No one does he command to act unjustly. A few weeks ago, I came back from a trip to Guatemala. And in Guatemala, we visited the martyr site of Father Stanley Rother, in, right by Lake Atitlan. Father Stanley Rother was a priest from the Diocese of Oklahoma City. And he went in 1968, and he worked among the indigenous people in Guatemala. And he was quite remarkable. He learned the indigenous language, and he created a tremendous rapport with them. But as the 70s went forward, there was a major civil war, and death squads started going into the various towns. Lake Atitlan is absolutely beautiful. There's this, this a beautiful deep water lake surrounded by three volcanoes. It is absolutely gorgeous. And yet in this gorgeous place, horrible deeds were taking place as the death squads came in and began killing his catechists and killing those that he had educated. It became so bad that he was on the death list and he fled Guatemala and went, came back to the United States. But while he was here, he kept finding out what was going on in Guatemala. He saw the people that he had lived with being suffering, being killed, and he decided he had to go back. He made the choice to return to Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. He died and was killed by the death squads very shortly after that. He had said, a shepherd cannot run. What did he choose? He didn't choose death. Rather, he chose love. He chose to accompany his people in the midst of their suffering. He chose to be with them even at the risk of his own life. And as a result, he won the martyr's crown. Choices are difficult. In the gospel, Jesus kicks it up a notch. He says the choices are becoming even more demanding. It's not enough, he says, he's come to fulfill the law, but it is not enough for his followers just to fulfill the law. He tells them and tells us, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives a series of propositions where he tells the old law and then tells what we should be doing. You have heard it said, you shall not kill. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother or sister is liable to judgment. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. You have heard it said, do not take a false oath. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Let your yes mean yes and your no, no. And in the gospel, it's really quite severe, where he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pull it out and cast it off. Jesus expects more of his disciples than he does from the scribes and Pharisees. He, despises, he expects a radical adherence to his mission. Does Jesus expect too much? Is it really possible well, I didn't see too many apostles walking around without eyes or hands, so I don't know if they took him seriously or not. And next week, we have Jesus says that we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Is it possible? Is Jesus asking too much of us? Well, we can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it just through a superhuman act of the will, where we want to will ourselves to be these saintly people. We do it by a total reliance upon Jesus, and we act through Jesus and his spirit. This is what Jesus is calling for this morning, total dedication to him, total dedication to his way. And today, 
we celebrate Lincoln's birthday, which used to be a major holiday. If you remember when Pope Francis spoke to the Congress uh, last year, he mentioned four great Americans. One of them was Abraham Lincoln. The other three were all peacemakers or pacifists. So I think it was kind of interesting that he put Lincoln in this group, because Lincoln was the president during the Civil War. But Lincoln was also a peacemaker. When Lincoln began the, the, was present at the beginning of the Civil War, he had some important choices to make. Should the country be fighting to free the slaves, or should he be working just to preserve the Union, to keep the United States together? And in the early part of the war, he decided the most important thing to do was to keep the country together. And he had to learn what the significance of the issue of slavery was for this war. In the early part of the war, he met with a delegation of African Americans, and he told them that even when you were free, the best thing you could do would be to leave the country and to start another colony. He didn't think that white and black could live together. But as the war progressed, Lincoln came to a deeper understanding of the relationship between black and white in the United States. He came to the understanding that the future of the United States and the moral future of the United States depended upon this issue. And so he moved to free the slaves. And in 1863, he came forth with the Emancipation Proclamation, which initially ended slavery in the United States. But Lincoln was a man of profound depth. As the war continued, he was known to have tremendous depression, fits of depression. As the reports of the casualties came in, 10,000, 14,000, 28,000, Lincoln would go into these days where he would just be overwhelmed by his depression at the loss of life that this war was causing. The only way he came to some sort of peace with the war was the understanding that the war was a penance for the nation, that it was a penance for the sin of slavery. God, who is just, had justly delivered a penance upon the United States. In his famous second inaugural address, Lincoln did a long reflection on the ways of God. And he said that there was a certain irony that both North and South prayed to the same God. He said, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. Each invokes his name against the other. The prayers of both could be the bo- prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been fully answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. And then he went on to say that the suffering was a result of the nation's choices. Both North and South had made bad choices, which had supported the evil of slavery. And he ends with his famous words: "Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray." that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. But if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so shall it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are righteous and true altogether." Lincoln went on to seek reconciliation between North and South, with malice towards none, with charity towards all. He didn't blame the South alone. This was a national sin and a national penance that had to be offered. He sought to bring the country back together by following what he saw as the way of God. His efforts were cut short by the assassin's bullet, but he understood the importance of choices. So this morning, as we reflect on Lincoln and Father Rother, on Jesus' words, what do we choose? If you trust in God, you too shall live. What do we choose as individuals? And what do we choose as a nation? Another piece of scripture gives us some advice. I have set before you life and death, a blessing and a curse. Choose life that you and your people may live. By loving the Lord, your God, obeying him, holding fast to him, for that will mean life for you. So this morning, we choose life, we choose love, we hold fast to the way of Jesus and put our total reliance and trust in him. Amen.